we're going to talk about reachability analysis uh, one-on-one. Uh, today, I'm joined with uh, Greg from Five9, who is a product security engineer. Uh, Greg, you can probably give a couple of words about your experience and what you do. So hello, everyone. My name is Greg Pettengill. I am a product security engineer at Five9. I actually started my I actually started my career in software development almost 30 years ago before the age of uh, the the types of packages that we now have to contend with. Uh, I did that for almost a decade, and then I switched over into product security uh, in the early 2000s, and I've been doing it for nearly 20 years now. Uh, my uh, area of my area of concern at uh, Five Nine specifically is around. Uh, third-party library problems. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, first of all, the, the the amount of software that is the pretty much the amount of uh, code that's written today is a lot less than it was when I was doing software development approximately 30 years ago. And so, you know, 80% of the code now is coming from third-party libraries. Maybe 20-ish percent of the code is written ourselves. I cannot stress enough how you know, I can't stress enough that the the amount of problems uh, that that potentially are out there, the risk in the application portfolio as a result of third party libraries, it should not be underestimated. And that's one of the reasons why uh, tools in general that that, uh, you know, software supply chain analysis tools are so important today. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Greg. And uh, I, I am uh, Dothe Fader. I'm a researcher at Endo Labs working on the program uh, analysis team. And um, uh, before joining Endo Lab, uh, I've been a PhD student at uh, Delft University of Technology. We have been investigating using call graphs, applying program analysis to software supply chain uh, problems. And before we dive into uh, reachability analysis, uh, it's always great to look back at uh, how did we sort of come to the place where we start reusing a lot of libraries, depending on open source in general, in our software products? And I found this uh, great uh, publication from the U.S. Department of Commerce that's on Management Guide to Software Reuse. And here they define a couple of interesting metrics that are quite interesting still today, which is around that software users sort of help us to be more productive. Uh, avoid using, uh, I mean, avoid uh, having lots of risks and also uh, cutting development costs, which is one of the main drivers uh, behind software reuse uh, in general. And uh, here is an outline of uh, two very important aspects with software reuse, and that is it tries to reduce software development time, costs, and risks. And the idea is that if we are reusing components, it should easily be well designed, well tested, and well documented. And all of this was already uh, discussed and defined back in the 1986. So one of the things that 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 is the problem with modern software development is, unfortunately, because a lot of the tool, a lot of the prod, or a lot of the libraries that we're using today uh, aren't necessarily designed by people who are making money, right? So. They're not necessarily the most well-designed, well-tested, and well-documented pieces of software. And so as a result of that, right, as a result of the fact that, that our time to market for software has gotten so intense, uh, you know, we're, you know, I in in my opinion, we've sacrificed a little bit, but but you know, I understand the reasons why we do what we do today. But as a result of that, we have to be much more diligent in 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 making sure that. Uh, you know, at least from a vulnerability perspective, that we are really trying to make sure that we are using uh, product. You know, we're using these products, these these third party libraries. Uh, you know, that they're that they're not necessarily vulnerable, right? Uh, or they're at least we understand the risks and we're willing to live with them. Uh, exactly what Greg basically went I mean, we are using a lot of open source uh, packages, which are then developed by uh, volunteers in general. And the interface to all of that is usually through tools, uh, for example, like NPM, Cargo, et cetera, where you can directly, for example, you know, search packages that solves your problem directly. You can easily, for example, if you need to uh, parse a JSON file, you can search for it and you can directly then later install it. And a very nice thing with package managers in general is that you kind of have a lot of freedom to install whatever you want because behind the background, it is able to do a lot of 
automatic uh, resolution of different dependency versions to avoid uh, conflicts. And then you have a centralized distribution where you can easily also, for example, if you contribute, uh, for example, doing an XML parse, you can also contribute that to the uh, community. That's sort of, let's say, like in a nutshell, how you interact with the software supply chain as a developer or even in a CI, CD uh, pipeline. And to give an idea of how it looks like, so for example, if I use my favorite packet manager, NPM, and I want to install a library, you often will see that it's not only downloading that library, it's downloading another 307 of those libraries. And that sounds like uh, a bit scary in general that like suddenly you're using lots of dependencies, but that's uh, uh, pretty fairly normal in uh, when you're using something from uh, an open source repository. And what you usually see when you, for example, install this library is that you have a set of uh, direct dependencies. Those are the ones that you declare in your build manifest. So for example, that will be accepts, body parser or proxy address. But then those libraries also have build manifests and depend on another set of dependencies. And those are called transitive dependencies. And here you can see like I marked, uh, like some of them are in control and some are in no control. With no control, what I'm saying here is that these are libraries that you didn't specifically want to include, but this is something that those direct dependencies are pulling in in your uh, development uh, environment. And this is uh, what is called the uh, dependency tree. And um, uh, here is an example of a build manifest. So. If you're making use of these version ranges, so for example, if you're using the tilde range, and if you do not pin specific version, you just use these version ranges, that means you're also allowing the build tool to automatically update the version. So if I'm running my build tool today, for example, build a web framework, we'll find that it will try to solve to these type of versions. And later on, if you sold three days later, because uh, uh, I mean, for many of these popular projects, the release cycles are pretty quick and they often release new versions very quickly. If I run this three days later, well, I'll find new versions with new patch uh, releases. And the interesting thing here is that since we don't have like any CI CD testing around uh, build tools, you are at risk of introducing breaking changes and you don't have any uh, control of it. Unless, for example, if you use automated dependency updating tools on GitHub, then of course you are in control. But if you just rely on the build tool, this is what you are basically exposed to. And what you're seeing over time is that uh, the number of packages in, in popular uh, open source repositories, like maybe Central, Nugget, uh, Packages, PyPy, they're all growing pretty rapidly. And by uh, adding more packages, and as you saw with the dependency tree, all those packages are essentially building blocks. And uh, if you try basically build on top of them all the time, you're also having more larger dependency trees as a uh, result. So one of the other things is, 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 is important to note here is that every one of these packages theoretically is an attack vector, right? In fact, you know, if you remember, Joseph, they, you know, PyPy had to shut itself down for I don't know how many days oh, yeah. it shut itself down because of the fact that they were receiving so many malicious packages um, and couldn't really validate, you know, who was who was putting them on and whatnot. Uh, you know, again, we have to be as a as a development organization, as a security organization, we have to be very diligent about what we're using. Uh, we have to try to vet. Uh, you know, one of the other things that that a good uh, software uh, supply chain analysis tools should do is also look at a lot of the metrics and metadata around the packages themselves. Things like the reputation of the individual who posts it, uh, the, the amount of actual uh, work that's been done on it. How often has it been you know, modified and changed? Um, is, that, uh, is that developer gone now? Is it, is, you know, is it no longer even being used? Has it been compromised by somebody else. There, there's a lot of things that we need to be thinking about uh, when it comes to this. Because mm. again, every one of these potentially is a problem, right? Especially if we have no control or if we're not paying for it, right? It's very hard for us to control. It. And like, from your experience, uh, Greg, um, 
I mean, importing so many dependencies, like how is it in practice, I mean, monitoring all those type of changes? Like, do you find it like very difficult or, uh, in, I mean, in general, because for example, in the example I showed, I mean, you can import 300 libraries. How do you monitor all of them? And again, I right as of before we decided to execute a program like this, right? I would say that's nearly impossible, right? Because the problem is, is we have no good visibility into exactly what's happening, right? Um, a perfect example, a perfect example of, of of you know something that everybody you know had. And again, like I said, these these the, the ones you're showing are some, but the one I'm actually thinking of is Log4J, right? I would say just about every software shop on the planet probably had to deal with this problem in one form or another. Uh, the the company I previously worked for, it took us two and a half weeks of 60 hour days or 60 hour weeks in order to to really try to ascertain essentially what our real risk was because we didn't have a centralized location where all this lived. Right. But my but my CISO, who came from another company recently, uh, it took him two hours because he actually had uh, tools, processes and procedures in place. So, again, a, a big, a big, big deal. And a bit on what Greg was talking about is that, I mean, we are building our products on open source. Right. And how do you know that you are affected by any of those incidents that uh, we always learn from by reading the news? So, I mean. I guess one of the main questions is like, how do you know if my organization use any of those libraries that are mentioned? And then there's the other aspect to it. So where is the vulnerability surfacing? Is it something that is in more control, for example, the direct dependencies, or is it somewhere like very down in our dependency tree, not transitive dependency? And I think the most important question is that since we're using so many dependencies, then it is, of course, very difficult to know what's really going on. Is every single incident something that affects me in general? Like, am I really exposed to the vulnerability that is being discussed about in the news or in other uh, places? And, and this is, let's say, like where the whole reachability analysis uh, comes to place. So if I have, let's say, like we want to track a couple of uh, different types, and for example, we want to know, you know, am I affected by vulnerabilities? Do I have, let's say, like the license violations or are there any of the, my, let's say, like dependencies that haven't been updated for a very long time and it's about time uh, to do that? And what you do is that you have your project, uh, you then build a dependency tree that I showed earlier. And uh, if you use, for example, like this cross mark and the other symbols uh, highlighted, like uh, next to the vulnerability license, if those are package versions, we find in this dependency tree that there are three of those. Um, and then the next step is basically to see where is the path from this package uh, to my project. And here we find uh, uh, two paths that are reachable. And that's basically how we let's say, like do the reachability analysis. We are basically checking if I'm using a vulnerable version and is that version, let's say, like reachable to me. And with reachability, the important aspect here is to see where does it happen? Is it, let's say, like in my direct dependencies or is it in my transitive dependencies? And here we have uh, three alerts. We have two security ones and one license. And then this is also the information that usually someone would uh, consume, right? Be it a developer or security expert. But then I think here is where the problem comes, right? I mean, we know that these are developable packages. And since we don't have more context than that, we need to basically prioritize all of them. And then you have to spend a lot of time manually to understand are we actually affected by it or not. And mm -hmm. with this type of reachability analysis, uh, sorry, uh, Greg. Oh, no, go ahead. Finish that thought. Okay, okay, yeah. So with this type of reachability analysis, we only learn about which libraries are important problems, but we don't really know like whether they're actually risky for us or not at all. So I, I want to I want to interject here because uh, what Joseph is saying is is one could underestimate the value of something like this, right? So in traditional SCA, which I I have personally I have a decade's worth of experience in, the the issue is is that once you once you onboard these these things in a traditional SCA program, you may find on average thousands or tens of thousands of findings, right? 
Uh, one of the one of the companies that I worked for pre in previously, we had twenty some odd thousand third party library findings. Twenty some thousand, wow. right? So so now what happens is, is so do you create a Jira ticket for every one of those twenty thousand? Well, if you do that, you might as well just hang up your hat and you might as well just go home because you will lose credibility almost instantly with, with any development, you know, any development staff that you have, because that's just not, that that's just not, it's not, you know, it's not scalable, right? Unless you've got 10,000 developers that, that can actually work on this stuff. So that being said, right, we need to, we need to have a better way. And this reachability analysis, in my opinion, is the better way, right? The idea is, is that, you know, in, in a lot of cases, you know, you may have 10,000 plus findings, but if you can narrow it down to those things that are actually being called. So if your first party code is calling through some sort of call path and it can go through a direct dependency, a direct and multiple transitive dependencies, once you get down to that dangerous API and it's known that that is a dangerous API, that to me is the evidence necessary to essentially go back to a development group and say, this needs to be fixed. Now, one other point I wanna make here is, is that, and you'll see in this, in, this, in this slide, what you're seeing is the problems are in transitive dependencies. So it's actually not in the direct pack, you know, it's not in the direct dependency, right? I will say that most of the vulnerabilities that I've seen over my career are indeed in transitive, transitive libraries. They're not in the direct libraries. So the question is, is what do you do? Do you ignore them? Well, in my opinion, you don't ignore them, right? Because it doesn't matter whether they're direct or, they're direct or transitive. But the nice thing about it is, is when you have, when you couple a uh, package analysis where you can actually go through from the direct all the way through the transitive tree, right? Down to the dangerous API. What that tells you is, is I know that the, here's the direct or here's the transitive dependency that is, that is that is bad, but I also know the direct dependency that calls it. So ideally, what we need to do is we need to update that direct dependency. And the hope is is that in some sort of newer version, it has been known that th there is indeed a problem, and they have fixed or updated their transitive dependency. So, you know, I, I like I said, I, I don't think we can oversell this, right? Uh, so when you couple both of those features together in any software supply chain analysis tool, it doesn't have to be Endor Labs, can be anyone, right? The idea being is when you do that, I think you've got a real good argument for being able to fix those particular findings. Those are the ones that get the priority. Mm. So like, uh, so a question that like more for like trying to understand. Uh, so what makes a transitive library more difficult than a direct library? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, if I could create, if I can take a transitive dependency, right, and I can just update the transitive dependency, right, that would be ideal, right? Mo I would say most times that's just not feasible. The reason being is, is because when you do that, if that, if, if the, if the API specification for that transitive dependency has changed, then you're probably going to break, you're probably going to break the communication between your direct and transit dependency, which in turn breaks your bill, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, so the idea being is, is that probably what you end up having to do is you have to you have to go back a level or maybe even multiple levels, depending on how deep the transitive dependency tree goes. And I've seen it where it could go 10 levels deep, right? Or more um, where, you know, you've gone through and your main one is fine and the next nine are fine. That 10th one way at the bottom, that's the one that's the problem, right? So, yeah. you know, you're not gonna, you're probably not gonna fix that one. You've gotta, you gotta go up, you gotta go up the levels. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And um, sort of what we've been uh, highlighting a bit is that using the current abstraction level, right? By just looking at, you know, the declared packages and version, it's not good enough. We actually have to be at the source code level because where we look at, using package information, which a lot of tools are uh, doing today, the only showing what's basically being declared between packages, right? It doesn't really tell exactly how we're using it in, in general. And this sort of, uh, I mean, a way to sort of, I mean, try to understand how we are, uh, uh, well, I mean, trying to understand what we're using in source code in general is by trying to use uh, call graphs. 
And what is a nice thing with Polygraph is that it, in a way, uh, approximates how we do code reviews. And of course, Polygraphs are also very important in general for program analysis when you do static analysis or dynamic analysis. And also is the foundation when you build further analysis on top of it. But in general, if you see this example here, so if you use, for example, an SPOM tool to analyze uh, package relationships, we'll find that the app is using lib1 and lib1 is using lib2. This is the general standard way and what we're showing in the previous example. But then if we try to understand how does it use the code inside, we suddenly get this view that we're seeing below, that there is a main function, a full function, and then if you look in our transitive dependency lib2, we have a function called used, intern, or unused. And imagine if you have a vulnerability or a problem with uh, unused, we can directly see here that there is no path from lib2 to app, which means that most likely this is not um, problematic at all. But if there's an issue on the use function, then as Greg was saying earlier, we actually have some evidence because we can see that for main, to foo, and then in, from basically from app to lib1, there's a path from foo to bar, and then bar to use here. But this is yeah. like the core, one, one core concept of how uh, you can visualize or analyze uh, code structure with app your application and then with the third party libraries that you import. Right. And so, like, like, like Joseph had said, right? So if intern in lib2, was the dangerous API. And there was a CVE that actually came out ultimately for this lib2. And it's been determined that intern is that function that caused that CVE. From that first party code to the first library to the second library, right? Then if, if we actually have that information at our disposal, right? And it meets our criteria, because again, this could be a low, this could be low risk medium risk, you know, high risk or critical risk, right? So everybody's risk tolerance is different. But, you know, if this was a critical risk, if intern was a critical risk, you know, then, then you know, through a call graph analysis, we could ascertain that, and then we could figure out how to prioritize that for, for fixing. Hmm. And then, yeah, so the whole idea of doing this as, um, like, first for citizens, so for example, if you have our uh, dependency tree on the left. What we do is that we provide this uh, to a call graph generator. We build a call graph per uh, product and then per package. And uh, it's something that we are called as the stitching process where we stitch them uh, together. Um, and then what you have is a package based call graph where you have all the functions of the application, the function of uh, each package, for example, the blue one, the green one. Uh, and then similar to the previous one, we also know exactly which functions are the problematic ones. And here, for example, we have two examples. Uh, one is bus and one is the JSON size. And we can see that the JSON size belongs to the blue package and the bus one belongs to the uh, green package. And then later on, I'll show like the main part where the less like the reachability analysis has a, a big impact and once we let's like start doing the reachability analysis, what we do here is that in your application, you have uh, your functions, for example, the main function, or if you have an API service, you might have all the APIs that also, I mean, if you have like a first class library, you might have all the APIs that you're interested in where all the uh, function calls are going. So you start with that, and then you basically follow down to see whether there are any paths uh, to it. And what we can see here is that JSON size is in no way, um, like there's no path from it, from the application down to it. Whereas like with the, the bass function, there is an actual path to it. And this is something that the reachability analysis will uh, discover. So I just want to put a hypothetical out there. So if you look at the, if you look at the call graph on the left, right? If for some reason the blue package had vulnerabilities, the green package had vulnerabilities and the red package had vulnerabilities. So let's just say for argument's sake, there were CVEs on all three of those packages. Without reachability analysis, right, that would generate probably multiple findings, right? So, so the idea being here is you would have a find, you would have maybe one or more findings for the blue package, one or more findings for the green package, and one or more findings for the red package. 
But the problem is, is that we don't know specifically, are we calling those dangerous APIs, right, within those packages? And that's the key, right? So this is where you, you this is where this 10,000, 20,000 plus sort of, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the concern that every developer has when it comes to looking at this sort of tooling, right, is, is if we can't narrow it down to those things that really concern us, that that's then then again you get this alert fatigue, right? And that's the big big problem. So obviously through reachability analysis, right? If we went to bar, so on the right hand side, if we went to that bar with the parameter y, that wouldn't generate a finding for us. But if we went to baz, right, with no parameters in it, then it would generate a finding for us, and that's very very critical. Mm, exactly, and what I think is like really the great part here is that we have a way to also prioritize, right? Because if you look into the previous without the call graphs, right? We would have two alerts, right? But because we have the call graphs, right? We can see the call paths where they're reachable. We now reduce one alert because we know that bar with the less than like Y parameter is reachable, whereas the JSON size, like in the previous one, like we saw in the call graph, is not actually reachable. And this gives us like information to start prioritizing and also for developers to see exactly where in the code is the problematic function. And instead of like looking through a lot of package declarations or looking uh, like Rick said, for example, deep down in the pen dependency, right? I mean, having to basically manually try to find the call path from that uh, 10 transitive dependency all the way to your application, it's... Uh, it's, I mean, I don't say it's impossible, but it's a lot of manual labor work to map that out. Whereas with the call graph, you can directly see the path from that 10 transitive dependency all the way up to main, if there is a path. And that also helps to better contextualize what are like the efforts needed to uh, resolve this problem or whether the, it is a problem uh, to begin with. But having this context is what makes uh, a big difference. And by the way, I'll, I'll just mention that 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 you know the other problem is from a personnel perspective is really what you require. If you had to do this manually, right? What you'd need is you first of all you need the developer in question that wrote the code, right? That wrote the first party code that calls the third party libraries. Second of all, you probably need a security engineer, right? Who has a background in software development, right? Who can literally sit down with the developer and walk the code path manually. Right. So you would go from, you know, from from the various, you know, from function A to function B to function C within the first party code and then eventually work through. And again, that's also assuming that you have access to the source code for the third party stuff. Um, this all has to be set up. It takes a tremendous amount of time. I know because I've actually done this before, uh, before this was really available uh, for a, for an old uh, company of mine. This is what I this is what I did most of the days. Uh, where, because what would happen is, is I would get, we would have a finding, somebody would say, we believe this is a false positive, this is not something we had to worry about. So now we have to try to figure out whether or not that's true or not, right? Well, the problem is, is only, if you only have one or two people that even have this capability, uh, you know, it's not scalable. That, that therein lies the problem, it is just not scalable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so again, having this sort of feature uh, you know, at least if you're if you're comfortable and confident that this is providing the correct data and the call paths are correct, then you know then then you can use this data. You, know, you can action on this data. Mm. And then, sort of like coming back to what Greg was also uh, earlier saying about that most of the vulnerabilities are around uh, transitive dependencies, and this is where I think call graphs are really shining because they're able to help us to know whether, uh, I mean, the problems in that, that third party library that is transitive, whether that actually directly is reachable or impacts the your uh, uh, project. And the reason why it does this can be simply done with a very simple example here. I mean, if you would use a tool without looking into the code, it will count that uh, app version one is using lib one, then lib two, and lib three. But then if you really look into the source code, we find that lib one is actually only using, uh, basically from the bar function lib one, is calling use and then intern. 
But then from lib two to lib three, this is where we see that uh, uh, all of this is uh, suddenly like really matters, right? Because we see that uh, function unused is calling used in lib three, but then there is no path from app to this uh, function. And if you don't have call graphs or uh, use any source code representation, you cannot get this information. And uh, this is where let's say, like all the difference is really uh, being made. Because when, when a capability like this exists, right, you have now as, a, as an organization the opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, uh, thin out your application, right? Because applications tend to have a lot of code bloat. And nowadays, applications tend to have a lot of library bloat, right? And so um, being able to remove these unused libraries, uh, first of all, I think, you know, could possibly, imp you know, improve performance. It certainly will improve any sort of other build or scanning activities that might be going on within your CI CD pipeline. Um, you know, I call it, by the way, the overall methodology that I have for updating libraries on a regular basis, plus getting rid of this bloke, I call it the care and feeding of an application, right? And unfortunately, what I've seen in the industry is, is I would say almost nobody does this well on a regular basis, right? Nobody puts this in their project plans, actually budgets real dollars to, to making this happen. It's a very, very, uh, it's a very small select minority of overall organizations that do this. And that's unfortunate, right? Because if we were doing this uh, on a regular basis, if most companies were doing this on a regular basis, I think what we would find is, is that uh, a lot of the issues that we have when it comes to third-party libraries would be minimized, right? Now, you'll never be able to protect against the zero day or something that just happens to come up. I, I understand that. But your ability to be able to react positively and rapidly to this sort of thing uh, really is, I think, increased quite a bit if you're if you're very proactive in this process. And before we will uh, go into a demo, so uh, to kind of so summarize a little bit, uh, like the difference between reachability analysis that uses code representations like call graph versus uh, non-code based one that use the metadata that is available in build manifest is that. If you use call based analysis, you basically get the context. So that's uh, where we say context is king. But a very important thing to keep in mind is that when you use the metadata based analysis, you should know that you're implicitly making the assumption that all the code that you're using are basically, I mean, you're using all the code of the direct dependencies and then in turn you're using all the code of the classy dependencies. And it's not only that, it's basically the entire dependency tree. So that it doesn't really make the analysis very uh, useful at all. And that's basically why we are having the call graphs because we can directly see through what we're actually calling. And if you see the example here, right? I mean, uh, we basically get the context, right? We see that uh, only one function of, sorry, like two function in lib1 is used. And then three out of the two functions are used in lib2, and one, one function of the one is used in uh, lib3. Uh, so one of the other things that I wanted to mention, so, and, and let's take a real, let's take a real world example, right? So uh, Spring Boot is, is, comes to mind, right? I, I, a lot of the companies I've worked for over the last, you know, decade or so essentially use Spring Boot as, as their primary thing. Spring Boot in and itself, right? has a lot of direct dependency of vulnerabilities, but it has hundreds of indirect dependency vulnerabilities as well. And so if, you know, again, if you don't have this sort of reachability analysis, right, uh, one could argue that you would have to go through and you'd have to update all these, you know, all these framework libraries, right, all the time. Now, I will tell you from, from a developer's perspective, anytime, so, Fixing libraries is a pain in the neck, right? It, it just is, right? Anytime you have to update libraries and application, right? You have to, you know, sometimes you have to do, you know, a full a, a retest, a full functional retest of the application. You might have to do a full regression test. Um, that's a non-trivial exercise. So in essence, what happens is, is when you, you know, if you don't have good data around what you ought to be fixing, right? then you know you, when you have to go through and you have to make these changes and you have to do all this additional testing, 
right? That really is a, is a big problem. It's one of the reasons why libraries, if, if it was so easy to, to do functional retesting and whatnot, people would be updating libraries all the time. And, and not most, most everybody doesn't do that, right? Even though we have a lot of tools out there that will automatically update libraries, a lot of times we're not doing that because it's just too easy to break something, right? And so I, I think that, you know, we want to, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to mention that because that to me, you know, that's a good real world application. If you had to update your Spring Boot framework, right, from version, let's say, five, four to six, right, um, which probably would fix a lot of problems. Uh, you know, the, the idea is, is that uh, that's the, again, that's a non-trivial sort of exercise. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to bring that up. So, uh, so for example, if you, uh, let's say, scan your application, these are, let's say, like the findings and here we're using uh, a call-based uh, uh, representation. So for example, we can directly see that this demo project that we're using here from, using it from Ando Labs uh, has one finding that's related to the whole arbitrary code execution in uh, Apache Commons uh, text. Uh, and then we can see like on the right here, we have, uh, let's say like the, the evidence for it that, you know, there's a call path uh, uh, that, uh, I mean, calls this vulnerable function. So we see that from the main function all the way down to this uh, spring lookup method, that we can see that there is uh, a direct call path. and. It's basically uh, through, let's say, like, you know, replace, substitute, uh, et cetera. Again, you look at this particular finding. So this is considered a critical finding, right? And if you look at the attributes on that critical finding, first of all, it says it's a direct dependency, which, you know, which is, you know, that that's actually probably a good thing because at least, you know, if you're going to update this to version 1.10.0, which is what the, which is what the remediation indicates, um, that's probably not necessarily a that that might not be as hard as as doing something that's way down in friends tree. But looking at the call path, the nice thing about the call path is is you can see specifically, okay, so here's here's the first party code. It's that com and or web app and or Java web app demo, right? You can see the first live, you can see the first bit of first party code, and then you can now see the transition into the third party code starting with main. You walk the third party code through the package, through replace, substitute, substitute, resolve variable, and then ultimately to interpolate or string lookup. And that is the smoking gun. That is the evidence. So if I had to go to a development group and essentially say, you know, I, I essentially say, look, um, we have a critical vulnerability. Uh, it's critical. I can prove to you that that we are calling this dangerous API. We walk to the tool, we look at the call path. And, and again, I can say that that gives me the necessary, uh, that gives me the necessary evidence to essentially say, you know what, I'm going, we're gonna, we have to create a JIRA ticket on this. We need to get this fixed ASAP, right? Because this is a problem. And in fact, in our organization, what we have decided to do is we have decided that we want to fix all critical and highs that are function reachable, uh, regardless of whether or not there are direct dependencies or transitive dependencies, right? So the idea being is, is we have made a commitment to essentially say what, what ultimately what comes out of whatever SSCA tool we use, and we happen to use Endor Labs, uh, that you know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna fix this stuff, right? As long as we can say with certainty we are calling these dangerous APIs, we're gonna fix it. You can, for example. I mean, filter, I mean, looking at uh, whether something is a test dependency, et cetera. That's also one thing we didn't really go into is that, I mean, when you build a dependency tree, I mean, you sometimes also include test dependencies, compile dependencies, runtime dependencies. And uh, I mean, okay, like with programs, you do get a bit more fine grade view of what is being used, but then, I mean, having less like the ability to uh, fine tune the reachability analysis, which what we are doing here is, basically saying that you know something is reachable something is a test dependency and uh, also for example if it originates from a direct dependency or a transitive uh, dependency and um, yes this pretty much uh, uh, concludes our uh, presentation on reachability uh, i hope uh, you enjoy the session and if you have 
uh, more questions that you would like to ask uh, me or Greg, always feel free uh, to uh, email us.